So the question comes to you in many forms. What is nature worth? And, and there's many, many ways of unpacking this. The kind of standard approach is actually the bottom approach, the bottom two, the monetary value of it. And there's various assessments that have been put out there. One that I read the other day was that it's calculated at about $125 trillion per year, which sounds very impressive. But I think the thing that really makes people move towards a state of action is the intrinsic value and possibly even, dare I say, a kind of spiritual value that people attach to their environment around them. And that really isn't something you can quantify, but it is something to consider. And maybe that's one of the hooks we need to be thinking about when we are trying to get more traction and more relevance in society with getting people inspired to want to conserve land and want to see more protected areas out there. And, you know, when you start looking at monetary value, there's all these lovely things that are attached to ecosystem services and what comes from the ecosystems. And a lot of it might be quite academic to many people. There's a lot of things in there that might not be considered by everybody. Um, but there are some things that really, really resonate and have traction with people, one of them being water. And we'll talk quite a bit about that in a moment. I've just put a list here of a range of various services that protected areas in particular act as refugia and, uh, for and maintain as a service to people living near to them or further downstream from these areas. So um, the Living Planet report from WWF um, quoted the IUCN as saying that 85% of species loss is driven by habitat loss um, on that, in that red list. And um, another figure that I picked up was that 17 million hectares of forest is being cleared annually, which is really, these are scary, scary figures. And, and this brings us back to this idea of may, maybe there is a need for something a little bit more formal than just goodwill. And this is where protected areas, I think, play a critical role because they have been identified as an effective mechanism for ensuring the conservation of species, conserving habitats, and a range of other things right down to your climate change mitigation and adaptation. And linked to that, particularly in the biodiversity stewardship space where there is still a maintenance of a, of a rural economy in the landscape, um, we, we will still see production from that landscape, whether it's agricultural production in the form of livestock farming, but also biodiversity dividends and services that can benefit downstream users. So really, really important to consider keeping people on the land, but still looking at some levels of formal protection and then also expanding the existing formal protected area networks provincially or nationally. In South Africa, and I, I'm still not entirely sure about this figure, but roughly 8.7% is secured formally. Um, and, and that really is quite an underachievement. It's a lot, but it's still an underachievement. There's a lot of work still to be done. And when you look at the IHE targets coming online, the, the task is really massive. So how do you get that traction I spoke about to, and the momentum you want to really start achieving protected area expansion at scale? Um, and, and it comes down to this concept of, of well-managed refugia-like protected areas that then sustain a number of services from fresh water to sustainable food production, carbon sequestration. There's a whole suite of these things that you can name here, and we could spend all day unpacking that. But the bottom line is that these areas are highly effective at, at maintaining those services and providing benefits to downstream users. And I, and I, I would stand by that statement. I think there, there are many cases, if we take the strategic water source areas as an example, um, I think it's about 3 point something percent of them are secured. And the term secured, when they refer to secured, refers to areas that fall within protected areas. And there's a reason for that, because there is legal recourse, there are structures, there's a way to measure things using the MET and so on, and there's a degree of accountability in terms of proper management to sustain goods and services. And I mentioned well-managed being the key here. So um, it cannot be implemented everywhere. Obviously, you cannot tie up entire landscapes and formal protection state, you know, levels. It's not going to happen. It's just, it's just not going to happen. But certainly, one should be focusing one efforts on the sort of jewels in the landscape, like strategic water source areas and so on, and also where there's an overlap with you know, very important biodiversity. There are opportunities here to compel adequate management. Um, to allow for meaningful contribution to targets, defendable contributions, real incentives, particularly in the biodiversity stewardship space, and a degree of accountability. Now, I I'm not sure if everybody knows what strategic water source areas are, but they are that 10% of our surface area that provides more than 50% of our water. 
And it's a very narrow kind of band that runs across the country. This one has this, the primary and secondary water source areas contained in the map. But if you look at that and you consider that securing 10% of our surface area would in many ways contribute towards our water security, I think already you would have a lot of, you would resonate with a lot of people. Um, WWF did a campaign, I think it was a couple of years ago, called, it went along the lines of water doesn't come from a tap. I don't know if you, any, any of you encountered that. But the idea was to start connecting the dots, to try and sell this concept that water doesn't just come from turning on a tap and getting it from a dam. It's reliant on ecological infrastructure. And if you want that infrastructure adequately managed and you want a degree of accountability, surely it makes sense to somehow formally secure areas such as this in a type of protected area network. And I think it's a relatively easy sell in a country that's drought-stricken right now in many places. And given the, the, the climate change impacts that are coming, um, you know, to be able to argue that case for actually formally securing these areas and incentivizing the, the proper management of them for the benefit of everybody. And it is critical for our survival. So, I mean, surely it makes absolute sense to secure areas like this. This is a typical rural scene where people are drawing water from rivers directly or from boreholes, unpurified water. Would it make sense to possibly disrupt those systems with incompatible land use activities? And what degree of protection can you offer in an area other than a formal, de formal declaration to offer a, the, the sufficient level of protection for those areas? I don't know anything other than formal declaration, to be honest, at this point. I'm hoping there's some other things coming online in the future. So, so what I'm going to do is give you one little uh, example here. We're going to focus on one small strategic water source area, which is the Pongola catchment. And in this catchment alone, there are over 2 million downstream users. Um, massive agricultural investments, and it's fruit and sugarcane farming further down the system. Um, there's a number of strategic impoundments down the way. Um, and numerous little protected areas at the source. Um, I think with the work we, we've contracted Conservation Outcomes to do a bit of work, and when that work is concluded, I think we're going to have a continuum there of, of over 100,000 hectares of protected areas, formally declared protected areas, right at the source. And there are competing land use interests at, at, at the headwaters of that. Uh, it's no secret there's, there are rather marginal coal deposits located there, and there are interests in harnessing those, those um, very, very polluting coal deposits. So, so what is more important here? Is it our survival and all these various economic, economic activities downstream, livestock farming, agriculture, potable water use, and so on, and the millions of downstream users, or allowing short-term gain activities that are going to actually then basically destroy that entire system? And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Classic example, uh, we've got tributaries down that system, and because of the dilution ability of the upstream reaches to dilute that river, it's mitigated in a way the impact of a mine that opened and closed 50 years ago and has absolutely obliterated every bit of life in a 10-kilometer stretch of that tributary where it joins the Pongola. There is nothing living in that river now. It's dead. And that's from one tiny mine that opened 50 years ago. And, and you want to mine the headwaters of a catchment like this. It's crazy. So the argument is very clear. You need some mechanism to ensure a sustained flow of goods and services for everybody to benefit from. And how do you sell that to people? I think I've already made a case. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. So when you combine um, our strategic water source areas and the existing protected areas, you're looking at around 15 or 16 percent of the surface area that's, that's covered by these areas. And now what are our Ichi targets that are on the table? 17 percent. So I'm handing you a platter here of potential that we could secure in terms of water source areas where there's an overlap with key biodiversity. And in many cases, there is. That's the beauty of it. In many cases, you've got national and provincial protected area expansion strategies that overlap beautifully with these strategic water source areas. And this comes down to making our efforts count. So an example is now, uh, I saw earlier the figure about very underrepresented grasslands uh, in terms of protected area status. So there's some wonderful stuff happening right now in the Eastern Cape, just as a little example, where we're wanting to establish a, a new national protected area in the Eastern Cape. All the various role players are online, um, and uh, it's an area that meets all the criteria. It's a strategic water source area, high biodiversity value, meets provincial and national targets, uh, is, is basically a, a place of extreme uh, biodiversity value 
and, and all the planets have aligned, uh, basically, and everybody's on board to make this happen. And within that area, we've divided it up into different nodes, and we identified node four as the area of most significant overlap and op opportunity. And when analyzing it, we find most of the reasons for it are people-orientated, actually, at the end of the day. It's about sustaining rural livelihoods. It's about addressing climate change. It's about uh, sustaining uh, water for downstream users. And the biodiversity plays a critical role in that space. And when presented like that, given that there's a strong focus on communities, equitable access, breaking the stereotypes of protected areas being exclusionary bodies in the landscape, but rather things that include people and provide streams of benefits, it gained traction immediately with government. And this thing that's been brewing for a decade is now basically the green light's been given. So watch this space. Really, really exciting stuff happening. And it's about selling the product. So I've just put a few questions here. And, and I just want to dwell on this for a few minutes because I'm nearing the end of the presentation. I think I'm well on time, hey? or, or not. Yeah. So, um, so the first thing is about how we make protected area expansion relevant. That's a key thing here. Um, for many, many, many years, it's been viewed as a kind of the domain of the privileged. It's kind of this thing there that gets done, and everybody's excluded. And that's where our relevance needs. We need to figure out how to make ourselves relevant, how to gain traction with communities, how to, how to appreciate the fact that in many ways, communities, the custodians of many of these areas that are so sensitive, are the closest to those services and often value them more than us concrete jungle kids who can turn on the tap and think that's where water comes from. So they really can be the agents of positive change into the future, and we've demonstrated this with some of our work. So there are ways to get traction. And also to ensure, and this is a very important message, I think, a, 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 what we call a just transition in terms of particularly climate change. So we talk about a just transition in industry. We talk about things like moving from coal to renewable energy and so on. And talking about how do you ensure a just, a just transition in terms of jobs from one to the other. But the same applies in terms of protected areas. You want to secure protected areas. It means maybe diminishing or reducing the amount of intensive agricultural use on land. How do you ensure a just transition in that space? And even more so in community contexts where land has been won back through quite a long battle. And the next thing you go along is the conservationists and say, we'd like you to be part of this, but we need a 300-meter buffer around that wetland because climate change is coming. How do you ensure a just transition in that space? It's a key, mess a key question for me, and it comes back to incentivization of conservation and landscapes. How do we foster and develop increased value for protected areas on a personal level and at scale? So this is where we go from those very sterile kind of... Um, numbers type approaches to actually developing a degree, it sounds quite flaky, um, of earth love, or for want of a better term. I knew you'd laugh. I knew it. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it's difficult to put a, a term to it that actually resonates with people. It, that certainly doesn't resonate with you, but it might resonate with somebody in Cape Town. So remember that. So, so it's about packaging it for the right audience. And, and this is the thing, is how do you develop that intrinsic value where if I see a, a wetland get destroyed, I feel personally aggrieved that that happened. That's the kind of level of, of caring that you need to have. And protected areas offer that avenue to then allow you to ensure that thing is secured for perpetuity. And if landowners have that degree of care for their environment, I'm sure you'll see a lot more traction. In many cases, it's already there. In some, it's not. And when you've got competing interests, it can be a problem. Okay. Then optimal management. How do we ensure that um, to enable these sustained flows of goods and services? It's a, it's a key question. Post-declaration management, I don't have all the answers, but I think there are some great ideas on the table. I'm sure those will be unpacked in a moment. And finally, how do we do all of this in the context of serious environmental uncertainty, particularly things like climate change? It's a key question. I don't have all the answers, but I do see a lot of progress in landscapes, and I do see a lot of traction and a lot of success out there, and I think it's easily measurable success, and I think we can grow that. So, yeah, having said that, thank you. <laughs>